Namaste and welcome to the next episode on Yoga Vasishta. Today we're going to talk about book one, chapters one and two, and we're just going to pick the highlights. It's up to you to read the rest of the story, huh? the narration that ties all these things together and gives it context. And so for that reason, I've included the materials in a PDF file, which you can download from the link in the video description. So please do that. And maybe it's a good idea to read chapters one and two before you watch the rest of this video. And then you'll understand the story context in which these highlights are occurring. One Sutikshna, a Brahmin whose mind was full of questions, went to the hermitage of Agastya and respectfully asked a sage, O oh, great sage, you are informed in all the ways and truths of virtue and know all the scriptures with certainty. I am in a great doubt and I pray you will kindly remove it. Tell me, in your opinion, whether liberation results from a man's acts or his knowledge or both. Augusta replied, as the birds fly in the air with both wings, so the highest state of emancipation is attained through both knowledge and acts. Neither our acts nor knowledge alone produces liberation, but both together are the means. So this is the opinion of a great sage, realized sage, not just any old sage <laughs> with book learning or a priest performing rituals and trying to make money by operating a temple. No, Agastya was a real sage perfectly self-realized. And for that reason, his answer carries a lot of weight. So what does he mean, knowledge and actions? Well, in the beginning of the Buddha's Eightfold Path, the first step is right view. And I would go so far as to say, if you really get right view right, that pretty much guarantees all the rest. And why is that? Because one effort performed with full knowledge has tremendous results, much greater than many, many efforts performed with partial knowledge. In fact, if your knowledge is defective to any degree at all, no matter how hard you try, you won't get any result. And we see this. <laughs> I live in a place, Tiruvannamalai, where many, many people, thousands of people come to meditate and to attain enlightenment. And guess what? Almost all fail. Well, for one thing, they're expecting results too quickly. They want to come here for a couple of weeks on vacation around Christmas time and get enlightened. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Enlightenment is a lifestyle. It's a way of living. It's not just an isolated incident. Oh, and by the way, there's no such thing as an enlightenment experience. Because enlightenment is not about the experience. It's more about the experiencer, the seer, not the seen. And not only that, in full enlightenment, even the seer disappears. And there is nothing left but pure consciousness. So how do we reach that state? A combination of knowledge and action. You may have good knowledge of theory, but then you have to really sit down and apply it. Huh? Like one of my teachers used to say, don't just do something. Sit there. <laughs> In other words, don't just read the scriptures and dream about enlightenment, but sit down and do the work, do the meditation, do the sadhana, 
whatever the rules or conditions are, follow them and sit intensively. Don't just sit for an hour or two. Sit for eight hours, 10 hours, 15, 16 hours a day. Then you'll get somewhere. Tell me what good and what evil are in heaven so that I may decide whether I want to settle there. I answered, saying, In heaven there is ample reward for merit, conferring perfect bliss to all. But it is the degree of merit that leads one to higher heavens. By moderate virtue, one is certainly entitled to a middle station. Virtue of an inferior order leads a person to a lower position. But one's virtue is destroyed by impatience at the excellence of his betters, by haughtiness to his equals, and by joy at the inferiority of others. When one's virtue is thus destroyed, he must enter the abode of mortals. These and the like are the effects of good and evil in heaven. Hearing this, O good maiden, King Arishtanemi answered, O divine messenger, I do not like heaven that has such conditions. Wow, this is an important lesson. Huh? Many, if not most people who perform spiritual activities and sadhana do so to gain some enjoyment, to gain some position in the spiritual world, in heaven. But actually heaven isn't very spiritual because it depends on your karma, your karmic bank account. If you have a lot of merit, you get a higher position in the higher heavenly worlds. But if you have correspondingly less merit, you get a lower position, less bliss, huh? <laughs> less virgins <laughs> or whatever, however it's measured in the particular heaven that you go to. And when you run out of merit, huh? just like if, if you have a lot of money in the bank and you go to a very expensive resort where everything is available, you're going to be spending a lot of money. And when that money runs out, you go from the welcome customer huh, to the bum that gets kicked out. <laughs> it can happen very quickly. And in heaven, Swarga, they wear these garlands that never fade huh, until you run out of merit. <laughs> When the garland fades, suddenly everybody goes away and doesn't want to talk to you because they know you're about to fall and you're about to enter again into the world of mortals. So what kind of heaven is that? Is it really very heavenly? How can it be heaven? How can there be perfect bliss, as the messenger says, if the prospect of running out of merit and having to go back again to the human world is always hanging over your head. So this is an important lesson. Let's say you accumulate so much merit that the messenger comes down from Indra and says, okay, hop on my flying saucer, I'm gonna take you to heaven. What's the appropriate answer? No thanks. I don't want heaven that's dependent on conditions. Instead, I want final release, moksha. And just like in the Yoga Vasishta, Indra may bless you that, okay, you don't want my heaven, that's all right, but you can go to an enlightened sage and you can learn the secret from him. That's the greatest blessing. So what kind of person is Yoga Vasishta for? Not somebody who wants heaven. Salutation to the Lord, the universal soul, shining manifest in heaven, earth, and the sky, and both within and without myself. He is entitled to read this work, who is convinced that he is bound 
who desires his liberation and who is neither wholly ignorant of nor quite conversant with divine knowledge. The wise man who has well considered this work as the first step and then comes to think for himself on the means of liberation truly shall be exempt from rebirth. So first of all, this second chapter begins with a wonderful invocation. Now, when they're talking about the Lord, it doesn't mean the Judeo-Christian concept of God as an old man, an old grumpy man in the sky, ready to send everybody to hell uh, for any little thing. No, what they're talking about is the universal soul, the self, Atma, Paramatma, the Supreme Soul. So this soul or self exists in everything and in everyone. The first path realization of the Buddha is precisely this vision, not just as an idea, but as an actual experience. I had this experience back in 1984 when I was living, or actually after I was living at Rajneeshpuram in Oregon for over six months, I left and I went home to my apartment in Portland and just sat. I sat 12, 14, 16 hours a day for about six weeks. And then one day I was having lunch and I felt like someone was in the room. And suddenly there was a tap on my forehead and boom, I could see him. I could see the Lord as pure consciousness everywhere, in everything, in the air, in the sky, in the ground, in the trees, in the walls of the house I was living in, and of course, even in myself. So when one sees this, once you see it, you can never forget it because it's accompanied by such a tsunami of bliss. It's indescribable and you know, this is it. <laughs> this is the real thing. There's no doubt. So this is attained by a combination of knowledge and effort. And what is the result? That one who is convinced that he is bound and who wants liberation, but who is not exactly ignorant nor completely uh, schooled in the divine knowledge, meaning uh, divya jnana, jnana, realized knowledge, not just book learning. Huh? This person gets to walk the path that's given in Yoga Vasishta not the religious person who simply wants to go to heaven by executing rituals. Huh? That kind of formulaic book knowledge is not going to bring you to real enlightenment, to liberation. Yeah, it might get you to heaven, but as we already covered, that's temporary. We don't want that. We want something better. We want the real liberation. So how to do it? well considered this work as the first step and then think for yourself through the logic of the whole thing. In other words, we already have the experience, the observation that this material world is a terrible place and we don't want to stay here. We don't want to get born again. We want to leave. We want to go into the self. We want to become the self. We want to merge into the self or however you want to describe it. Actually, there's no way to describe it in words. But to do this, one has to act on the knowledge he has received. And what is that action? It's not running around here and there and doing stuff or performing rituals or anything other than thinking it through for yourself. All of us already have more than enough experience in this world to understand the actual position, but we misinterpret it because we have investments in ego and material desires. So if we really think things through 
and we understand the actual position, then we already have the experience. We don't need to sit and meditate anymore. Huh? We can reach full self-realization just by the penetrating insight derived from this knowledge. Brahma said, Do not, O sage, give up your undertaking until its final completion. No pain ought to be spared to make the history of Rama as faultless as it ought to be. By this work of yours, men will pass over this repetitive history of the world, samsara, in the same manner as one crosses the sea in a vessel. Again, the uncreated Brahma said to me, I come to tell you this very thing, that you complete the work for the benefit of mankind. So Valmiki had already written the external history of Rama. And of course, studying that and meditating on it and so on gives religious merit. But again, religious merit can only get you to heaven. It can't bring you to liberation. So Brahma returned to him and other people were questioning him also. Well, what is the deeper aspect of this history of Rama? What was going on inside Rama's mind when he attained full enlightenment, liberation? You should write that history, and then your history of Rama will be as perfect and complete as possible. Until then, don't stop. Huh? So that's why this work is known as Maha Ramayana. The ordinary Ramayana is there for religious minded people. But for those who want the highest benefit, this Maha Ramayana is there as a vessel for crossing the ocean of the material world. And so Brahma told Valmiki to do this, to complete the work for the benefit of mankind. And that's why I think this work is such a perfect vehicle for our own work, because it has the same uh, intention. The intention of my work is to benefit all mankind by giving not just one or two or, or a few little methods of meditation, but by talking about the whole range of spiritual life. In fact, even going back to the very beginning of the fall and narrating how we came into this material world, because in order to be released from the trap, you have to understand how it works for two reasons. One is that the same process of becoming that leads to material existence also can lead to enlightenment. And the second one is, one has to understand the result or the effect of different actions and how one kind of action, one kind of becoming leads to being trapped in this world. And a different type of action leads to being released. And so how do those relate to one another and how does it all fit together? That's given in our series on the esoteric teaching. It was by this means that Lakshman, Bharata, the great-minded Shatrugna, Kausalya, Sita, Sumitra, as well as Dasharat, with the Kritashtra and the two friends of Rama, and Vasishta and Vamadev and the eight ministers of state, as well as many others, reached the summit of knowledge. Well, my son, if you follow the manner in which these men observe sacrificial rites, gave and received their offerings, and how they lived and thought, you are at once freed from the turmoil of life. One fallen in this boundless ocean of the world may enjoy the bliss of liberation by the magnanimity of his soul. He shall not come across grief or destitution, but shall remain ever satisfied by being freed from the fever of anxiety. Wow, this is a blessing. Huh? I wish you all to receive this same blessing. 
How? Exactly, by following the manner in which these great souls spoke and thought, gave and received their blessings, and lived in the world, but not of it. And in this way, you can receive this same blessing through the magnanimity of your own soul. What does that mean? You don't need anything. You don't have to desire anything. You don't even have to know anything. <laughs> but if you become what you really are, pure consciousness, then you will never suffer. You will never be poor. You will never be helpless and you'll never be alone. This is the great blessing of this Maharamayana, the Yoga Vasishta, which I want to impart to everyone without distinction. Om Tat Sat, Om Harihi Om. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam